Footy. All right. The original cast of True Footy is back at it again, boys. I don't know when the last time we all did a video together was. I reckon 2019 we were all together, maybe. It might go that far back. 2022, uh, 2023, sorry, Busher. The start of 2023 was when we you had you. And Joycey, I think the last time we did a video with True Footy, it was 2021, talking about Adam Chair at Fremantle. So a lot to catch up on today. Busher. Let's start with you. Yeah. What have you been up to, mate? You've just been in Japan. It's good to have you back on the channel. Yeah, yeah, bloody good couple of weeks over there. It was a whole real last minute thing. Literally two weeks before the trip, a mate of mine messaged me going, yeah, I got twin rooms most of this trip in Japan. You want to come? I was just like, yeah, probably. I'll just check with the old man. And two weeks later, I was flying to Japan. Oh, that's good. Well, in the lighting, it kind of looks like you spent some time in Colombia rather than Japan. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> mate, it's good to have you back on the channel. Joycey, it's good to reintroduce you to this channel because it's been a while since, you know, you've been here on here on it's for an extended period. Uh, you're a bit of a self-proclaimed Jared Waitley of his generation, so um, I'm thrilled to have you. How have you been? <laughs> oh, well, it's great to be <laughs> It literally took me 20 seconds to remember who Jared Waitley was. <laughs> <laughs> so who the fuck is Jared Waitley? I was like, just it's not be funny to throw a random curveball at you. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, how are you? It's good to have you back on the channel. Literally, since you've been on the channel, um, you have gotten married and you've got a kid now. So, how does it feel to be the only grown up in the room right now? Uh, yeah, it feels feels pretty good, mate. And it's um, it's awesome to be back on the channel. Although I haven't been on for a while, have been observing the channel um, over this time. I've seen you lurking just... in the comments, Joycey. <laughs> That's right. Can see uh, Jesse's been kicking goals, so uh, you you've been putting a lot of work in. So I think everyone should um, get around True Footy for 2024. Thanks, mates. We're all we're all founders. We're the founding fathers. Uh, Louis could couldn't be with us today, but we might see him on the channel as well. But he was originally part of the crew that started the True Footy podcast, and now with the advent of modern technology, we can do this over StreamYard. It's actually been possible for a long time, but this is the first time we've actually managed to do it. Um, so it's good to have you. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about a little bit about the preseason. Um, you boys are unfortunately Fremantle fans, so we can cover off where they're at. Um, we've got quick fire predictions and then general season predictions. So let's start with the preseason, boys, and I'll get this little tab up here. Brand new to StreamYard, flashy stuff here on True oh, Footy. Hey. Um, and we'll just talk about the preseason. Um, I'll start with you, Bush. I know that you're in Japan. Did you did you manage to follow much of uh, what was going on? Um, even if it's just free mantle takes, what did you make of the preseason? I'll put it this way. I had a fantasy draft of Joycey and some other friends the other day, and my first round pick was Caleb Daniel, and I found out he's on the cusp of being dropped. So... That's the extent of where my knowledge is at at the moment. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. I think if I didn't do true footy, I probably wouldn't follow it that hard. Joycey, you you possibly follow the preseason a little bit more extensively. We were talking footy chat the whole time. Yeah. So um, anything yeah. that you made from the preseason? Yeah, I've been uh, gagging for a bit of footy uh, this year. I was really enjoying it, very hopeful until last Friday. Uh, and and then was brought back to earth a bit. But um I think there's a few positive signs for um, quite a few clubs, especially watching North Melbourne. I was thinking, gee, this is, I think, the best they've looked in a long, long time. I think finally North fans can have something to be excited about, I think. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. They definitely look like they're playing a bit more of a competitive brand. The thing with North in particular, at least my take on it, is like if we fast or rewind rather, back to the first two rounds of 2023, they looked shit hot. Like they had just beaten us and obviously we're not a good team, but the the way they played and the way we played as well was much better than what the latter would eventually suggest. And then the week after that, they went and beat Fremantle in Perth, um, which was not a tough, which is not an easy task, sorry. <laughs> so I, I guess that flows on to the next question. Like, well, I don't know what to make of it with North. I think their best is good. But it is just preseason. Do you guys think these days we take too much out of preseason? Well, we've always taken too much out of preseason, but I'm going to get in one of my bold predictions for the year. North Melbourne finishes closer to eight than 18, I reckon. That's a that bold prediction. Is a bold wow. record. Yeah, wow. Yeah. North fans will be pleased to hear that because I've tipped them for the wooden spoon. So it's nice for them to have some refreshing perspective on the Truth Buddy YouTube channel. What, what makes you think that about North? I just sort of see they've got enough youth through the door now. They've sort of, most of them have had a season under their belt that's ready to take that sort of next step to sort of being half relevant. 
And I think there'll be some surprising teams that fall off more than we think they will. Definitely For the record, West Coast year. probably won't cop the spoon either, I don't think. Well, I like be someone weird, it, I think. Someone weird will cop the spoon, I reckon. I do like what I'm seeing from North as well. I don't think the latter position will be great, personally. But I think the exciting thing is the fans will be able to see a group of players that they can get behind for the next decade and be like, yeah, this is my team now. These are our guys um, that are going to take us to the next level. I think um, those key defensive positions, unfortunately, you just can't ignore that. Um, and as exciting and as, and as aggressive as they want to play, they're going to get really exposed on the turnover. And I think it's going to hurt them. So I just hope that they can kind of keep positive and maintain that good attitude because, as you kind of alluded to earlier, Jesse, um, we know that it only takes a couple of bad losses to really, you know, demotivate a playing group. Um, so me personally, I've actually still got them, you know, probably second last, but um, I think there's things to look forward to. Definitely. I, I think there's, there's reason to believe in North and there's some some structural things and on-paper things that made me concerned for them. Um, and that is, you know, sort of the justification for them winning the wooden spoon. I'm not necessarily completely committed to it. I just think it's an easy argument to make when you look at the best 22. And, you know, Griffin Logue's done an ACL, obviously, and he's their best defender. And Aiden Kaur's in doubt for round one. So, you know, they're going to play GWS in Sydney in their first game. And their key backs might be Toby Pink, Biggie Nguyen, and um, someone else that's kind of escaping me at the moment, or Callan Dawson. So, like, on paper, that's a, it's a hard case to make that they're not going to be exposed at times. It, it might not guarantee they win the wooden spoon, but I, I totally agree with all the positive signs. And I think their youth, some of the youth that they've compiled there, like Wardlaw, and McKercher, Sheasel, and Zane Dersma as well. Like, I think it's really top end, and they, they can absolutely be optimistic. It just might not translate in wins. Like, on top of all those guys, you've got your Simpkins, your LDUs, your Larkies. It's not just these guys I've taken the last couple of years. All those guys I just listed are very good players as well. So that's a good 10, 11, half their 22, pretty sorted. I agree. Huge fan of LDU. Larky speaks for himself. Um, Simpkin. Fell off a little bit last year, I think, in output, but still pretty good player. I, I don't know if the depth is there. That's my argument against them, but I, I should stop making yeah. that argument because I think North fans <laughs> think I don't like them or that I don't rate them. I, I do see the potential, but um, yeah. Yeah, you're right. They do have some good middle-tier players. It's probably the structural thing that works against them. But the other the other thing against like both North and West Coast, as you said, there is going to be teams that probably fall in a heap this year, but it's so hard to predict who they're going to be. Like, it always happens inexplicably. We don't really see it coming, um, which makes it tough. But another team that has been, uh, I think, a little bit underrated in terms of, like, media and, you know, my comment section and the general AFL belief is your boys, Fremantle. We won't talk about Fremantle on the entire podcast, um, but you guys obviously are pretty committed Freo fans, so you've got really good perspectives um, as opposed to Druzy. Nah. Um, so I just want to get your thoughts on how, Fremantle's gone this preseason. We'll start with you, Joycey. What did you think of the two games? They kind of went in different directions, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, look, all due respect to West Coast, I don't think we took too much out of that game. I think it was pretty clear, you know, our mature, mature bodies at the contest really um, got us on top of West Coast. I didn't take too much out of that game, to be honest. Apart from it was... Great to see uh, Five back. Thought he looked like the fittest he's looked in a number of years. He looks visibly leaner to me, um, which, yeah, I'm hoping he can stay fit. Honestly, that, that was basically it, other than, yeah, maybe Pat Voss, Cooper Simpson, watching those guys emerge, Tom Emmett. The Port game, we can't read too much into preseason. I do agree. However, there were concerns there as well. My main concerns being... I just felt the ball movement was still an issue. And although it's pre-season, you would hope to see the things we've been working on over the summer would be, you know, working on those deficiencies from last year, which I think, yeah, namely was, was the ball movement piece. I think too often we're relying on our talent to win us games rather than our game plan. Um, and whilst I am uh, actually a Justin Longmuir fan, I, from what I've seen so far, it's just not clicking something 
is not transferring or the communication between the coach's box and the field. It's it's not quite there yet, but very early days. It's only one preseason game. So, you know, whilst I'm being a bit harsh on J-Lo, I do also believe we need to give him some time to turn it around this year. I'd sort of, I'd agree with the points about the Port game, but my one counter to that is we had most of our starting 22 forward line not playing that game which is a yep. big thing for the ball usage and link up and continuity and all that stuff. So they would have game planned around a lot. Jackson probably being a link up guy further up the ground. Amos being the deep target. Freddie using his pace to dominate. Yeah, I think um, I think the stat was like five marks inside 50 to Fremantle, but then you look at the players who missed and it's it's not really a big deal. The thing is with preseason, like I get it, it doesn't sound good coming from me right now because the Eagles played horribly in the preseason, so it just seems like a hollow excuse. But the, <laughs> I've, I've been around enough to, to know that like not just West Coast, but other teams have come out and looked pretty lackluster in preseason. And then in round one, we're a completely different team. Like The example I put in my newsletter was Port Adelaide 12 months ago. They, they came to Lathlane. They lost to West Coast. They lost to Fremantle by five goals. And then in round one, they beat the Brisbane Lions, the eventual grand finalist, by nine goals. So, mm. you know, th- I think there's so many different variables at play. First of all, it's personnel with Fremantle in that game. But it's also like sometimes teams with their training loads that d- deliberately play these preseason games under fatigue. I've read that before. Um, I don't know why. It's a conditioning thing, like a loading thing to, to get ready for the entire season. But um, sometimes in round one when they're a bit fresher, you know, we see a very different team. Is it? Did you guys say this morning? I'm pretty sure I didn't dream this. I always wake up to the footy chat here in the UK. But Sean Darcy's got an injury. Joycey, did you post that in the chat? Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, uh, I think he's had some minor surgery on a knee today. Um, the club was pretty vague on a return timeline, but um, the consensus seems to be three or four weeks. So whilst it is disappointing, um, nothing too major, and. Um, you know, we got some good stock to cover Darcy um, for those couple of rounds, I think. Yeah, Bush, you were saying you, you wanted to see Reedy perhaps in round one rather than just go with Jackson as the, the number one ruck. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Well, well, this would be subject to Darcy's timeline. Like if it's a scope yeah. surgery where they send in a camera in or whatever, have a look and they find something nefarious and it turns in eight, ten weeks, maybe then go with Jackson as the primary ruck. But if it's going to be only a few weeks, go with someone like Reedy who has shown a bit and that allows Jackson to sort of get used to playing the one role they've been training him for the whole preseason rather than chucking him in the ruck. Yeah, I mean, as an outsider, I have no idea how ready your rucks outside of Darcy and Jackson are, um, but that, I think I do agree with that. I do think, you know, if you lose Sean Darcy as a ruck for a few weeks or a month or whatever, um, you've got Jackson. Like, Jackson statistically did really well in the ruck last year. Like, I think he had multiple games with over 40 hitouts when Darcy wasn't available. So. As far as the ruck goes, you don't lose out, but it's it's the Luke Jackson as the forward that you you lose. And he kicked 22 goals last year, a goal a game, and he's still, what, 22 years of age. So you extrapolate that. That's uh, structurally and, and the talent you lose in the forward half, I think that makes it tricky. But, like, fingers crossed, it's only a, a short-term injury and it won't matter too much. Bush, you've also done a really good job of getting through the preseason Frio chat. And you, I haven't heard the name Hayden Young once. Uh, what did you make of Hayden Young in the preseason game? And I thought he was really good against Port Adelaide. Well, statistically, because I didn't actually get to see the games, but statistically sure. it looked like he picked up right where he left off at the end of last season when he got thrown in the midfield, getting high 20s possessions, good tackling, good work, good defensive work on his opposition midfielder as well. That was something understated that he brought to our midfield compared to some of our more offensive-minded mids. And, again, his disposal efficiency, even that's a bit down, I'd back his disposal over just about anyone in the league. He's kicking his chef's kiss. I think he gives you midfield a different look. And um, like Joyce yeah. has touched on, I think Fife coming back in there is a bigger body and playing his more natural game. I think he's clearly a better midfielder than he is a forward. But even if he's, you know, handballing more than he's kicking and he's blocking and he's – I heard him talk about how he feels a lot more comfortable – and confident in both his role and his value to the team. And I think there's a lot of upside there, even if it's not a brown low season. Joycey, what are your other observations like? Did you what did you think of Hayden Young um, and any other players that caught your eye? Yeah, um, start with Young. Oh, seriously impressive game. Actually think he stepped it up from 
where he left off last year. The thing I noticed, and this kind of goes against what you said, Bush, is that we actually used him as our most advanced midfielder. He ended up having five shots at goal for the game, kicked two goals. I do like the idea of using that for, yeah, using his kicking as an offensive skill rather than, you know, always going back to that quarterback position that that we so often, you know, put these players with good good kicks in. But he was seriously impressive. Um, he is a great um, defensive player as well, as, as Bush has said. I just feel like having, you know, Young and Brayshaw in that on-ball brigade, like that's really, really good stoppage defensive unit there, um, like elite tacklers um, right there. And I think the um, defence from stoppages has been an issue. That's a really good fix to that problem immediately, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't a great game for too many of the others, but um, again, good just to see Fife just get through the game and he, he was still definitely um, serviceable. I think um, Pat Voss as well is going to be an interesting watch. I've mentioned him a few times. Um, I think he might be a handy pickup. Cooper Simpson has shown a bit. Um, in particular, his acceleration, Cooper Simpson, I've noticed a few times, seems to a very, very high level. The speed in which he will pick up the ball and then and move, you know, that, that first four or five steps is very, is lightning fast, lightning fast. Um, kind of reminded me of, um, you know, Judd's first four or five steps where it was really like powerful straight line, um, which is exciting. So they're they're probably... The key ones. Lastly, yeah, probably Reedy as well. Um, you know, he, he's pretty young. He's very raw. But again, just touching on the loss of Darcy, I think um, shown he can probably do a job. If it means we can keep Jackson forward, um, I'd probably back in our mids to to potentially shark the other ruckman. With playing Reedy in the ruck, is that you can sort of make him the guy who gets substituted and then put Jackson in for the back half of the game sort of thing. So that's a way you can play Reedy as well. If he doesn't have the tank necessarily to hold up for a full game, playing hard competitive AFL standard rock. Yeah, I agree. There's lots of nice little green shoots there for Fremantle, I think. Um, and there's a bit of a knack there with like picking up your lower cost recruits. Um, there seems to be a few good ones. You mentioned most of them. I can't remember if you said Oscar McDonald, but I think he's a chance for round one with Brennan Cox. Is that right? Yeah, very serviceable. Obviously, we, we lost Joel Hamling in the off season. Um, but just watching McDonald play his couple of games, um, I feel like it's a very good like for like replacement. Both pretty dour, but good one on one defenders, I think. I'd agree with that. Um, let's talk a little bit about Long Muir and the media swirl that's going on around him. I think, Joyce, you posted an article by John Ralph yesterday talking about like internal rift and and how yeah. there's mounting pressure and stuff. Um, you did clarify, Joyce, that you were a generally a long mule fan. Um, actually, I'll throw this one to Butcher first. What, what do you think, what is the pressure gauge on uh, Justin Longmuir at the moment? And do you think that the media swirl is justified at the moment? I think there is a bit of pressure building because how good we looked two years ago, we've sort of just fallen off a cliff to a degree. But in saying that, like you see a coach like Dimmer Hardwick at Richmond before they won, they went into the dynasty mode, they'll call him for his head a few years before they finally broke through. So it's one of those things you probably give Longmuir the extra sort of – I'd give him another two-year extension. Like, I wouldn't give him anything more than a three-year extension because if in another year or two we still look anemic offensively and terrible, you've got more years on the contract and it's harder to get rid of him then. But I think for the continuity and building stability, give him another couple. He's in his last year, so, you know, the club can take their time with this. There's no need to make a rush decision right now. I don't think let's let's just wait a little bit, kind of maybe reassess at the halfway mark and and see if we think things are improving. Generally, I am I am a fan, and because I agree with Bush's sentiment that I've seen a few examples of of clubs sticking it through these tough times, and in the end, it has paid off. Uh, I think yeah, Richmond's definitely the obvious one, uh, but I think you know Melbourne had some pretty tough times with Goodwin. Pre, pre their success as well, um, and Buckley as well. I'd throw in there. Um, yeah, like Collingwood were pretty piss poor 2016, 17 by their own lofty standards, and then twenty eighteen yeah. makes the grand final, and they were relevant for a few years. So I agree with that. Yeah, that's right. So I think yeah, 
the the club needs to give him a chance to to build something. Um, having said that, the I understand there's a tipping point as well. So I would really like to see something this year, like some sort of progression. If you know we get to around 14, 15, 16, we're still having these ball movement issues, um, and you know other issues. I think you know the club will fairly ask questions of Longmuir about what is the long term plan. You know, again, is the game plan sinking through to the players? Are they understanding? Is everyone on the same page? I guess the other fact as well is I don't feel like there's that many great candidates just sitting in the wings waiting right now either. Um, so you know. What do we have to gain by sacking Longmuir? One counter I would have to that, someone I would be interested in replacing Longmuir with if we do go that direction is Josh Carr. Because the year we did make finals, Josh Carr was his lead assistant. Everywhere Josh Carr's been as a head coach or a top assistant has had success. So I think Josh Carr would be a viable replacement if we do decide to go that direction. Yeah, I definitely think he'd be one of the top targets. I think they'd probably look at Jamie Graham. Jamie Graham's got some very big raps on him, I know, internally. Uh, And I think the West Coast Eagles, I think he was very highly thought of there as well. So I think they'd be probably the the two main candidates for Freo to have a look at if something were to happen tomorrow. Those two and Buckley, maybe. I guess the thing with Buckley... um, and I do like Buckley. I think he's, you know, great culture builder, strong leader. I don't think you can ignore the fact that Collingwood got immediately better when Buckley left is my only counter to that. You know, Fair. even though he played for the Eagles and coached at West Coast for a while, whenever I think of Jamie Graham, I just think of that car crash of a knee injury. Do you guys remember that? Yes. Did you see that book? Before my time, I think. Yeah, lucky. Because, uh, yeah, I think it's on YouTube and it's disgusting and it literally pops into my head every time I hear that name. Um, yep. Let's tie up this Fremantle chat before we move into more season predictions. Uh, what, what are we expecting this year? I want a prediction out of both here. Um, Joycey, where do you think Fremantle finishes? Uh, it's it's a bit boring, but um, I kind of have them in a range with, with a group of other clubs, so like Essendon and Gold Coast. Uh, if I had to put a number on it, I will... I will say 12. I think they'll be fighting it out with Gold Coast for the 12th spot. Is 12th enough to keep Longmuir's job? Um, It kind of depends, doesn't it? I think 12 is 50-50. Again, yeah, I kind of alluded to the progression side of things. If, If it's 12 but we can see something building, I think he just hangs on. But any lower than 12th, and I think he's in real trouble. I'd agree with that. What are your thoughts, Bush? What's your prediction? And, uh, yeah, no, go with the predictions. Similar sort of vein to that. We're in that clump of clubs that's going to be fighting for the last two spots in the eight, but there's six, seven teams that are probably fighting for those two spots. So if we just miss out in that 9, 10, 11, 12 range with a half-decent record and miss out on percentage or something like that, that's probably a passing grade, I guess. Yep, fair enough. That's kind of in line with what I said in my ladder prediction. And I think that 12 mark is bang on as to that's probably the threshold at which he keeps his job. I mean, again, could he finish 13th and keep his job? Maybe, but I think we're all same, sort of in the same ballpark of, of expectation there. Um, all right, boys, we've got a quick fire prediction section and uh, I've got 10 little quick fire questions. I did this with Druzy. And we're going to throw it to both of you. And it's just going to be pretty much a one-word answer. But if you want to explain it, that's fine too. So the first of these 10 questions, it's a who finishes higher. And out of Sydney clubs, who do we think finishes higher out of Sydney and GWS? What are your thoughts, Joycey? I'm going to say significantly GWS. Wow. Is that a distinct lack of faith (laughs) in Sydney as well? Yeah, I mean, we might talk about sliders a little bit later, um, mm-hmm. but I think Sydney are being very overrated by a lot of people right now, just my personal opinion. Huge. We'll unpack that in a little bit. Uh, Bush, what are your thoughts? I'd agree GWS is going to finish higher, but I do think it's plausible both teams make the eight, but GWS in most versions of events are going to finish higher as they did last year. They're still a bloody talented team, even though they... They didn't even really bleed any talent this off-season, did they? No. 
don't think they lost anyone. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. If it, if it was That's a change a of pace player. for them, but they've still got an abundance. Yeah. Yeah, I think they've had a couple of good years of retention in a row now, which is a good start. Um, let's move to South Australia. It's not who finishes higher, but who wins the showdowns? Now, you can say one all, or you can say one club wins both. Joycey, who's going to win the showdowns this year? This is a tougher one um, for me. I I think both of these clubs are really good clubs. Um, I think I'll go with Port. Um, I think Port are a very well balanced club. I think they've got good players in all all lines. Port um, and their midfield is just starting to get real deep now that Horn Francis and Bergman and and those types are uh, Willem Drew kind of really coming on. Ollie Wines is back. We know how good Butters and Rosie are. So I'll go with Port, but I think Adelaide are really going to push for the top eight. I think Port's the vastly more talented team for all the reasons Joyce alluded to, but I'm going to say draw because I think Adelaide does have enough in the tank to pull a showdown out and win one each. I think they're I, a good I like it. Team they won the both showdowns that. last year despite finishing lower. Um, I'm going to agree with a one-all draw there, and I didn't say my Sydney GWS when I have GWS higher as well. Who kicks more goals this season? Isaac Rankin or Tom Papley? Now, I'm pretty sure off the top of my head, Papley might have kicked one more goal than Rankin last year, but I can't remember if he played more games. I think Rankin only played the 20, but I, I can't remember. So just off top of the noggin, Joycey, who kicks more goals? Rankin. Yeah? Yeah. I like Papley. Don't get me wrong. I think Papley has never kicked less goals than Rankin, but this year is going to be the year that... Rankin overtakes Papley. I'm going to say Rankin's definitely the more dynamic, talented player, but I'm going to say Papley because I've heard whispers that Rankin's going to get more midfield time, so that could throw a spanner in the goal kicking. Was somebody whispering sweet football nothings into your ear? Probably was our spoon favourite in our fantasy league saying that probably, so I'll take it with a pinch of salt. Is he big spoon or little spoon in that dynamic? (laughs) Oh, it could be a big back-to-back spoon. (laughs) <laughs> no further questions um, I, I think you both make the points there. I think it might still be Rankin but he did play a bit more midfield time but I think it might not be enough to really limit his goals it's hard to know he kicked four and had 20 against West Coast but that and that was in three quarters but you know four and 20 buys aren't that good uh, I could get right. 10 and 2 against West Coast <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I realise we've got a bit of a South Australian flavour in these first four questions, so forgive me. But who finishes high this year, Port Adelaide or Carlton? Uh, Port Adelaide. Ooh, huge. Do you think it's too early for Carlton? Not necessarily. I, right. I think they're both good sides, to be fair. I think they're both good sides. I think could both be pushing top four. I'll back in Port just because I think they've been a bit more solid for longer than Carlton. I was going to say Carlton because they've sort of made that prelim. Now they need to have a solid full regular season to sort of prove themselves now that they have made that bit of a run in finals. And the back half of the season last year, they were red hot, one of the best teams in the comp. So I think they're going to build off that and have a fully good year instead of half a good year. Yep, fair. I um I think I tipped Carlton higher on my ladder prediction, so I feel inclined to say Carlton as well. But the case for Port Adelaide is very strong too, and that's why I picked it because it's a pretty, pretty tough one. Uh, the next one's an easy one for you, maybe. Fremantle's best and fairest. Joycey, who do you think takes out Fremantle's best and fairest award? After watching Bush's man on, on Friday, he, he was seriously impressive. So I'm going to go with Hayden Young. I think there's yeah, real potential to really elevate his game. Yep, I'm going to say the exact same thing because as you guys know, I said in the chat a few weeks ago, I think you even, I think I even commented it for one of your videos, Jesse, but I think Hayden Young's going to win a Brownlow before Sarong or Brayshaw or be the only one to win a Brownlow. Or I was going to say it implies a part of the three pay. Most likely to win a Brownlow. <laughs> Most likely to win a Brownlow. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I who won it last year? Did Jackson win it or was somebody else? Oh, was Sarong. Oh, it was Sarong, of course. Yeah, yeah. I would have said that he was probably sure. Yeah. 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 Um, I not that I really give a flying shit, but I'm gonna say that Andrew Brayshaw mm. has a return to form this year. And maybe yeah. that's a bit of hope. I like Brayshaw. And we kind of owe him yeah. one after 2018. Hey. Uh, what about coaches sacked? 
how many coaches get sacked this year, if any? This is a tough one off the top of the noggin. Um, uh, to, to help this a little bit, Simo and Beveridge probably enter the year under the most pressure. And to be honest, other than that, it's, it's kind of tricky. Like you, you'd have to see some things go really pear-shaped for some teams. But Joycey, do you have any opinions on coaches getting sacked? Well, just just looking at the you know the the bottom clubs on the ladder, obviously I think Clarkson is basically no chance to get sacked. Um, I think Simpson will be okay as well. I feel like West Coast knew that there's going to be a few dire years and backed him in last year. And I think they probably knew that this year would be tough as well and, and were still willing to back him in. So I think Simpson will be okay. I should think uh, Longmuir is probably the most likely to lose his job, either Longmuir or, or Beveridge. I think the dogs are pretty talented. Um, so I'll back Beveridge in to keep his job. I think, honestly, I think Longmuir is 50 50. So um, if I was to punt, I'll say one coach. I was going to say, if Luke Beveridge does not play Caleb Daniel, I hope he gets sacked. But I'm thinking two coaches just sort of seems like the law of averages type of thing. Beveridge is a contender. Longmuir is a contender. They might be a surprise contender. I think any time a coach on a million-dollar contract doesn't pander to some random guy's fantasy football team, he should have that contract <laughs> torn up. Um, I, I'm Caleb Daniel is a seriously talented player. Yeah, that's true. Just because he's from um, the Shire doesn't mean he's not talented. <laughs> I'm going to say that I don't think a coach will get sacked this year, actually. Um, I think we, we've covered all the right names. I think Beveridge will do enough. I don't think uh, I rate the Bulldogs to at least play finals. That's probably the threshold. The same point about Simo. West Coast don't have a sacking coach culture. We didn't sack Woosher. He, he stepped down. And so it was Ken Judge before that. And other than that, it might, you might have to go to bloody 1990, the last time it happened. So... Um, Unless things go horrifically bad, which is possible. And Longmuir, I think, will keep his job too. So that's that's my opinion. I think I think everyone will be safe and everyone's happy. Let um, me uh sorry, quickly put one to you boys. You know, there's there's no nothing new in the news today, but let's say Melbourne have a new cultural issue arise. Do you think Goodwin comes under scrutiny? Um Again, because he's the head coach and he's supposed to be responsible, you know, for building that culture. And there's been even a few whispers about Goodwin and his behaviour. I, I think there is potential for them for there to be some pressure there as well. I mean, it d- does depend, obviously, what the story is and how deep it runs, right? So are we talking like another drug scandal? Are we talking like, um, I say another one, like we've, it was Joel Smith and there's a bit of, you know, in um, ambiguous talk about another player, the high-profile po- profile player there. I don't know. Like, it's also another question, like, will it create a media swell and create pressure? And then there's should it? And I, I don't mm. know if, you know, if there's another player who gets busted for drugs, I don't know if I really think that Goodwin should fall on his sword for that necessarily. But unless you can find a, a, a causational link there, what are your thoughts, Bush? Well, it's kind of tough because like we were sort of saying earlier in the podcast, he had a few of those rough years before they found success. So you could make the argument that he fell into that success because of the excess of talent the team had. And if these cultural issues continue and they have a down year, he certainly was one of the sort of smoky guys I alluded to in my two potential coach sackings. He was sort of a smoky. But I'm certainly not advocating for it. I don't think they should, but he'd be a smoky if they have a down year. Yeah, I mean, at the risk of going down this sort of tangent too far, but like I think, I think too much like responsibility and scrutiny gets concentrated on the coach with these sorts of things, and I think it kind of overlooks the responsibility of players for the culture. You know, like West Coast had the biggest drug culture <laughs> ever, well, yeah. at, at least the one that got publicized. But like, it's not as though John Worsfold contributed to that. Like he's He's a pharmacist. Like he doesn't. He's like the most straight. He might have guy. contributed then. <laughs> he might have cooked it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, <laughs> that they stuck fat with him, and then the culture improved. Yeah. Like I, I would think it would have been the wrong decision to sack Butcher. It would just be a kind of case of wrong place, wrong time. And I think the co- the players need to own the culture just as much as the coach. That's my personal take. But. Yeah, I definitely agree. But I also would counter saying with the Eagles drug stuff, Ben Cousins was a higher profile guy than Joel Smith. So Ben Cousins was more up to be the fall guy in such a scenario. 
wrongly, certainly, it's certainly unfair to be media scrutiny and all these things pushing for it rather than actual fairness. But in terms of a land of media scrutiny, Goodwin could be made out to be the fall guy because Joel, Joel yeah. Smith's not enough of a story for the media to milk the shit out of. Yeah, that's kind of where I would see it going as well. I, I actually, actually don't think there are any cultural issues at Melbourne. In fact, I think Melbourne have a very strong culture. I think, you know, Gorn, Petrarca, Angus Brayshaw, you know, all these guys, um, they just seem like very, very reliable, good characters, right, um, that you'd want to build a footy club around. Um, however, yeah, I, I think there is a maybe potential for a media narrative to be at play here and that to put pressure on on the club. Yep, well articulated. I, I think we're on the same same logic there. I think you're right. The media has a lot of sway with these sorts of things, but hopefully no one gets sacked unfairly. The next question is about the West Coast Eagles. Will they win more than four games? So five, will they win five plus? No, they won't. Um, I think there'll be improvement there. I, I've got and them. That wraps up through footy podcast. <laughs> I continue. Uh, I think they. I think four wins will be where they'll get to. So not more than four. Fair enough. Fair enough. Bush. How many did they win last year? Three. I'm going to say yes. I think you can get two more wins than last year because you've hardly read through the door. The other young guys have had another year of development. Your health has been a nightmare the last couple of years, so hopefully that swings back into a, a bit more reasonable degree of health as a team. I think that could be enough to get you five wins, probably not more than five, but for the purposes of this question, I think they can. You know, I didn't expect the more generous prediction to come from Bush around you two, to be honest, but thank you, Bush. <laughs> um, no, it was generous. <laughs> we are talking about splitting hairs here. <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> Wait, what would you say? I said four was generous, I thought. I was just like, probably was generous. <laughs> <laughs> probably possibly, was. But possibly. Basically, yeah, basically I mean, got three last year. Yeah, if, if, you, there. if you had three last year, if you have four this year and can see some improvements and some, some more youth blooded, I think that's a good result for West Coast. Yeah, I'm only taking the piss. And a I better mean, percentage than 50 or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, we're splitting hairs between five, four, or three win, like, or yeah, whatever. So, yeah, we're, we're pretty much all aligned. Um, I probably predict five at a push six, but I've certainly not gone predicting anything further than that. Um, four or five wins. I, I think, honestly, before we move on, I think if we have a good injury or at least a normal injury run and we only win four games, I think I would be flat with that. That's probably where I sit with it. Um, but, you know, very reasonable predictions from both of you, I think. Who finishes higher out of Essendon and Richmond? Gee, uh, this one's really tough, I think. I'm going to say Richmond could fall either way. Um, I'll just back in those season vets and, and, you know, like Tom Lynch. Um, if Dusty can come back and, and play a role, uh, then I'll, I'll, I will back Richmond in on this one, I think, just. I'm going to say Essendon. They've sort of been on the cusp for the last few years. They've probably got a bit more firepower on paper. If they have another crap year, whichever Scott brothers they coach might start coming under a bit of scrutiny. You're not saying he'll get sacked, but he'll be under scrutiny for next season sort of thing if they don't make the aid or go quite close. I think Richmond have the top-end quality still, and I think Essendon have a little bit more of a well-rounded and slightly better depth outside the 22. Um, and I think comparatively, if one of them hasn't or both of them have injuries, then I think Richmond's been more vulnerable. I could see them finishing higher, but I did put Essendon higher in my ladder prediction. Gold Coast Suns, their best ever season is a 12th place finish. Will they finish higher than that? Will they have their best ever season this year, Joycey? Oh, man. These are tough. I suppose that's the good thing about them being quick fire. Um, point, yeah. Yes. Yeah. First year I think that kind of goes against what I said before. They'll be fighting it out with Freya for 12. Freya will finish 12. Still possible. I think they're still in that mix, could finish 11th. What about you, Bush? Well, I'm going to say I think they have the best win-loss record they've ever had, but they might still finish 12th or lower. But mm. I think they okay. on track to sort of have their best win-loss record. So I think that's the way the ladder's going to play out. It's going to be picking hairs for a lot of teams. Yeah, for the life of me, I don't remember where I put Gold Coast. I think I might have actually had them 12, um, to be honest. So, yeah, it's going to be real ballpark for them. Uh, 
Yeah. All right, the final question. Does Ross, the boss, get the Saints to finals for a second year in a row, Joycey? I'm leaning towards yes. The reason is I just I think they're pretty well balanced. Again, they got some good key forwards, some good small forwards, um, good back. Um, the midfield's okay, good enough, good, good use. So I just think because of the good balance of, of the team, I think they'll be able to play out the season and get enough wins to just sneak in. Yeah, probably in the scraping club. Don't feel too strongly either way, though, whether or not they make finals. But yeah, you sort of probably got to give them the benefit of the doubt with their track record. Well said. I am pretty hot on the Saints. And I, I do see the vulnerabilities. They don't finish seasons well, but I think the talent profile and the skills that they've injected into their side this offseason through draft and trade and, you know, over the last couple of years. I'm optimistic for them. And I think fourth is not completely out of the question. It's not my prediction, but I think I'm pretty, very confident on finals. Cool, boys. All right, final segment. We're going we're gonna to throw some uh, proper predictions out there rather than just quick fire ones. And we're going to talk firstly. I want you guys to nominate a breakout star from the league. Now, breakout is such a subjective, ambiguous term. Like it can be a second-year player who makes a name for himself, or it could be someone who makes all Australian or somebody who wins a brand low unexpectedly. So I'll let you set your own parameters and just nominate a player each that you think will break out this year. Joyce, we'll start with you. Yeah. So the, the player I've gone with, yeah, he, an established player um, has had decent seasons before, particularly two years ago, a very, very good year. Um, sort of struggled to make his side last year and subsequently traded uh, that is Jack Ginevan. I think people have kind of written off this kid, but I remember the final that Fremantle played Collingwood um, a couple of years ago, and I remember thinking, gee, this kid, he's actually really good. He's not just, you know, someone who just hunts for free kicks. He, he does that, and it's a big part of his game, and he's good at it. Uh, but I think there's serious talent there, and I think people have written him off a little bit too quickly. Uh, I think he's in for for a big year. I like it. I like it. Bush, anyone you want to mention? Hayden Young? Or... Well, I was going to say, you've written on the cheat sheet here. Yeah, I know Hayden Young, but who else, Bush? So my answer was going to be Hayden Young, but I've got another. I've got another name I'm going to throw out there as well. Logan McDonald. Ooh. Now that he's had a full preseason without Buddy there, he's the clear number one key for the Swans. This could be his breakout year, I think, for Logan McDonald. He won the Coleman in the Waffle League before he was even drafted. That's the kind of talent he is. And he's sort of at that age where he's been a few years in the system, beefed up, done everything you want a key forward to do. I think he's ready that's, to roll. That's how good he is. He won the, won the Coleman. So he won the AFL highest leading <laughs> goal kicker when he wasn't even in the Coleman. league yet. <laughs> the Bernie Naylor or whatever the Waffle Coleman's called. <laughs> no, I like it. Good nominations, both of them. Isaac Rankin's the, the boy I'm thinking of. Like I've done so much content previewing this season and coming up with so many different nominations. And so there's a bit of recency bias here. And I didn't have Isaac Rankin in my predictable Australian team. And I regret that now because I think he will be all Australian this year. And I mean, we saw this kid pre-draft and he wasn't just a small forward when he was uh, drafted. Like he was a midfielder forward. And what he was doing up the field was arguably his A game, let alone how good he is in front of goal. He's become a good goal kicker as a small forward, 36 goals last year. But if he can become an impact forward to the role for the midfield, what's that? Oh, no. I counted them myself. <laughs> you can't, hurt a Harry, can't help a Harry Potter reference. To be fair, I, I love them. But I've heard that one enough, Bush. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you've never heard that one enough. <laughs> Rankin could kick 45 and still be a decent on-ball rotation this year. And I think he is just locked in to be a gun. So I think this is the year we see that. Let's yeah. talk about teams to bolt. Teams to bolt. Um, and again, this is a little bit ambiguous, but uh, who have we got potentially bowling into finals or, or whatever? Uh, Joyce, we'll start with you. Um, Adelaide is the team that comes to mind for me. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of potential there. Really like um, what they're doing. I think, yeah, the, especially the forward line, it, you know, Tex Walker, he's really reinvented himself in the last few years. Um, and with Rochelle and, and Rankin, uh, down there as well, Tilthorpe gets fit. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of potential to cause some teams some headaches. Well, I was going to say, if Bolt doesn't necessarily mean make finals, I was going to sort of allude to my yeah. earlier thing, North Melbourne, I think, is going to Bolt a yeah. little bit. They won't, they won't make finals, but I think they'll 
bolt up yep. the ladder more than people expect. I like it. And I'd be happy to see it for as much as uh, I've caught criticism for having them in the wooden spoon. I would I would genuinely be happy to see North do that. That, that sounds good. Um, I, I might double down with Adelaide. Like I, in my ladder prediction, I think I had the – I only had two teams that to jump into the eight, and they were Adelaide and the Bulldogs. And I don't know if the Bulldogs moving from ninth to eighth is a bolt, but I think in terms of the gap from what we saw last year to what we could see this year, Adelaide absolutely comes to mind. If I had to throw some honourable mentions, St Kilda, I think could re- like consider the upside last year with their forward line injuries. They were one of the worst ever sides for forward fifty inefficiency. But if you see a full year from Max King let alone the quality smalls that they have. I think there's huge upside for St Kilda. I don't think they'll become a premiership contender, but like being good enough to qualify for a double chance and then ultimately not going that far could be could be a bolt for them. Look, another, uh, they are my side, but I think there is a bit of potential with Fremantle if the ball movement thing can click, if Darcy and Jackson, if Jackson can make it work as a forward, um, and you know he him taking a key defender with Amos and and Tracy down there, I think there is a bit of potential there, especially with the WA factor as well. Um, you, you know if they start playing decent, you assume they basically win ninety percent of their home games. That that's enough right there to get them ten or eleven wins, and then the odd one on the road as well um, could see them potentially going fourteen or 15 wins, something like that. It's all about getting the game plan right first. I, I agree with that. I think the ominous sign for Fremantle uh, for, for everyone else is like when teams, they might be inconsistent, but if their best football can beat Melbourne at the G, if can beat Sydney and Sydney and, and Geelong away. Admittedly, Geelong and Sydney weren't great last year. I think for a number of years, Fremantle have shown this ability to match up with the best and then falter later. I think that is actually, that is evidence of a side that could like improve rapidly and just click. So I, I don't mind that call, whether it's this year, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. But teams to slide, Joycey, you you mentioned Sydney before. Is that who you're locking in? Yeah, look, I, I think Sydney, um, I think they kind of got away with one last year. Um, and I think, you know, we're kind of riding on the fact that they made finals last year as the fact that they'll be good again. But, you know, if it wasn't for a score review, they might not be, might not have been in the finals. I just feel like, especially with Mills out for half the year, Parker's going to miss the first month. Um, I do worry about that midfield depth all of a sudden. Um, I, I love Goulden, but he's not going to have, you know, those big bodies protecting him like he was last year. Um, I do also think the key back's potentially an issue. Um, for them with with um, McCartan now out and Buddy's left as well. And McDonald has, he's just not quite clicked. I don't think how we thought he would just yet. Um, and again, him and Amati, I think they're decent young tall forwards, but, you know, I think there's a lot of clubs with better tall forwards as well. So they're probably the club for me that I think will drop out of the eighth. Buddy, even though he was old and on his last leg, structurally teams were still sending their best defender to him. He was running to all the right places, even if he was a step slower and all that. So that is definitely yeah. going to impact Sydney there. But in terms of my slider, ooh, Don't Melbourne. Don't do Buckley and say Brisbane. A bit. Sorry, uh, everyone, I guess because they're not playing at the Gabba much this year, are they? Because of the Olympic renovations and stuff, are Brisbane not playing at the Gabba much this year? I don't know if that's this year. I think that's I think that's future years. I could be wrong. Possibly. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's this year. Because there's not anything about that. Okay, if it's not this year, I'm going to say Melbourne. But if it is this year, I'll say Brisbane. Fair enough. Because if it is this year, Brisbane's made the Gabba a fortress. They've shaky at the MCG and these sorts of places. So if they don't have that Gabba fortress, they're definitely going to slide. Whereas if they're still playing most of the home games up there this year, I think Melbourne, with some of the off-season stuff, Angus Brayshaw's medical retirement is going to hurt them. Clary's going to take a bit of time to build up to form, even though he sounds like he's going to be ready for round one. But he's not going to be 100% Clary. So I think Melbourne's going to slide. They might not miss the eight necessarily in this slide, but I think they'll slide. Yeah, I, I agree with the logic on both. I'm bigger on Sydney than you are, Joyce. But in terms of uh, my sliders, I think Richmond is probably the biggest slider down my ladder prediction. Um, and it was just the case I made before. I, I think the top end's good. If, if Uze can implement a system that 
gets the best out of those players quickly, which is a question mark. But if he does, then they will yeah. prove me wrong very quickly. But I think they're vulnerable to injury because the middle layer of their list is over 24 rounds. I'm not sure how well that's going to stack up, but we'll see. Wooden Spoon predictions. Finally, my boys get a mention. <laughs> Joycey, what are your thoughts on the Wooden Spoon this year? I think I've got to go with the Eagles. Um the I think it's mainly the injuries. You know, you've alluded to the fact on the channel that, you know, when everyone's fit, that the West Coast Eagles actually still have a, a, a semi-decent list, and, and I agree with that, um, or 18. Uh, but I think you're already starting behind the eight ball, um, and I think it's so hard in season to come back from that with injuries. I think that's, that's going to hurt, um, especially, you know, if McGovern or Barras were to go down. I think that would be, yeah, huge. Um, yeah, so I'll have Eagles finishing last, but I think there will be improvement. What about you, Bush? You've said, you've kind of said that North or West Coast won't win the spoon. I feel like you've alluded to that. Yeah, but I'm, what are your thoughts? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with that. I don't think either of those two teams win the spoon. I like it, but I can't tell you the team that's gonna shit the bed either. <laughs> So on paper, I have to say the Eagles, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be some unforeseen team that just shits the bet this year. Yeah, I've put North. I mean, I'm an Eagles fan. I I can see any outcome possible. Um, But, I mean, logically speaking, if I think we are well and truly capable of getting five or six wins, I feel like that never really gets you the spoon. Maybe five, but not six. So it'll all play out. Yeah, I I think you guys are 17, 16. I think seventeen, sixteen yeah. for you guys. Oh yeah, is there, I'm not expecting any better. Is, than that. is there a world where West Coast and North finish higher than Hawthorne? Do we think with their injuries? Yeah, I think it would have to really depend on Hawthorne taking a massive step back. I think the midfield is pretty good, even though it's young, mm. and I, I think they're going to miss Miss yes. Will Day for a little bit. But like Newcomb, and um, he's the first one that comes to mind. But the, the midfield in general, that's way deeper than either North or West Coast, and that's and their forward line, they've just transplanted in a completely new forward line. Yeah. I can't see it happening. I, I disagree. With, I, I'd give some bite back on that, actually. I think North Melbourne's midfield's a lot better than Hawthorne's. LDU, Wardlaw, Sheasel, McKercher, these are all top-end talents, whereas a lot of those Hawthorne guys are solid, but they're like borderline A-graders, whereas some of those North Melbourne guys could be A+. Plus. They, I think... But what are they right now? He's got a bit of midfield from Young. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i agreeing with what Joyce is hinting. Um, like, Wardlaw's played eight games. Like, LDU is a star. Like, he's got a he's a better midfielder than anyone at Hawthorne, I would say. Um, John Newcomb's the best challenger, but I, I'm a big fan of LDU. But now, like, um, Simpkin, uh, Taron Thomas, you take out of this team. Wardlaw's played eight games. Like, he's going to be good, but he can have a good year for a second-year player, average 22 disposals, and it still won't really match what John Newcomb's doing, for instance, right? Um, and then McCurcher as well. I think I'm not that big on Newcomb. All enough. Australian squad last year, I, I think I think um, some will disagree with you. but he's, one, he's a better one of those guys who gets the ball, but he doesn't do much special with it, really. That's That's harsh. my thing with Newcomb. I rate yeah, Newcomb. Yeah. Is what it is. I, th- I think he's a pretty damn good extractor, like as a inside player. Like he's quite dominant for his age as well. Don't forget he's like twenty two. So, um, and Will yeah, Day is very good as well. Yeah, Will Day won their best and fairest last year. Yeah, Day's so. got some upside. I'll give you that. Day has upside. Yeah, I, I, I think, think I think, West I think Coast Newcomb's have to hit his it. ceiling almost, and Warpool's hit his ceiling. Yeah, but there's some other guys like Josh Ward, Cam McKenzie. Like these guys are on the up. Connor Nash is a bit underrated as well. So. I think the midfield bats way deeper than North and West Coast, but North is better than West Coast, that's for sure. Um, top four predictions, guys. We'll keep rattling through these. Um, we, we might package this into one, okay? So I want your top four, your grand final matchup, and your premier. Okay, I'm winging this one myself, but I think I need, do I have to put them in order, my top four, or no particular order? Yes, order. I'm going to do no, no oh, order. Oh, fuck. Ooh, Reverse okay. alphabetical order. Okay, if we're going in order, I'm going to say Collingwood top of the ladder, okay. Carlton second, Port third, Brizzy fourth. Cool. And that's with the Gabba caveat, of course. 
for Brisbane getting fourth grand final like I'm thinking it's going to be coming about the Gabba thing like it's it we're either going to get roasted for not knowing about the Gabba or Bush is going to get roasted for saying it <laughs> I feel like I definitely would have heard of that as a thing if it was this I've heard year. Of it, I'm sure it's not this year I'm sure Brisbane have home games this year are Brisbane playing at the Gabba yeah. this weekend yeah so I don't know if like later in the season it changes I don't think that's true though I yeah I might be wrong but Collingwood Carlton Collingwood win I nice guess. That would be huge. That would. Joycey. I think Brisbane will finish one. I think the Brisbane, Collingwood, Melbourne. Uh, oh, last one could be a toss-up between a few. I'll go with Port Adelaide in four. Same top four as last year. <laughs> Not in that order, though. Is that? But, I, I was going to say, is that the order? Um, Not yeah. I mean, they finished top four for a reason, right? Um, I think Collingwood are the best team, so I will back them in to win the flag again. I know that's a boring answer, um, but I, yeah, I'll back Collingwood in. Runner-up, I think Melbourne could prove a few people wrong. I think the talent is still crazy good there, um, and if they can turn, again, these these cultural things into like a bit of a you know, us against them mentality, I think um, they'll be really out to prove a point. Um, so I think Melbourne. I like it. I'm going to think... jump in quickly. I just Googled the Gabba thing and, yeah, it's end of next year. Sweet. Sweet. Cool. <laughs> just, to, just to put that out there. Nice. True footy's come, come through with the research at the last minute. Um... <laughs> Jamie, look that shit up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I did my prediction like a few weeks back and I think I actually can't remember the exact order of who I had top of the ladder now that I think about it. Um, I think I had Brisbane top and I think Sydney and GWS were third. Shit, I can't remember. Forgive me. But my grand final was a Sydney GWS grand final. Now, since yeah. that happened, Sydney have made me a bit nervous. So Luke Park has broken his arm. We know about Callum Mills already. And Taylor Adams has done a knee. Now, that's not going to necessarily mean that they're not going to be deep in finals. But suddenly those opening fixtures do get a little bit tougher, which might influence them whether they finish third or they finish fifth. And that's big, right? Yeah. So I'll still say GWS win the flag. They might just do it over the Brisbane Lions this time. Um, and yeah. I think I think I had Carlton fourth. That's right. So I think I went Brisbane, GW, GWS, Sydney, and Carlton. That's a score wow, no two. Collingwood. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, they're, they're the best team. I know that. But I, I would try to mix it up. And I think. Yeah, yeah. It is a bit of a boring, boring answer, answer, isn't it? Their, their list as well. Like if Darcy Moore goes down versus yeah. a Harris Andrews going down, I think Brisbane are well equipped as an example. Yeah. Um, and I think you can, you can make that case all across the field, to be honest. Sweet. All right, boys, let's finish this off with a few awards. Um, we'll go through these fairly quickly. Uh, first of all, Brownlow Medal, Joyce. Who are you tipping? Brown no medal, um, it's got to be Nick Dacos, unfortunately. Again, the boring answer, but he's he's the standout um, to me. I'm going to say the Bond. Oh, I like, I like it. it. I would love a Bond to win one. I would love Bush to win one. I'd love Bond to win one. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, really like I'd love to win one it. too. I, I've said Dacos and Walsh is my prediction. And I think Walsh has been ruled out of opening round and got a bit of a back complaint. And every single game he misses. First three rounds. Oh, okay. There you go. So probably rule him out already with the rampaging Dacos. So I'll say Nick Dacos as well. Who's your smoky Brownlow? I'll go Connor Rosie. Like if that's it. a smoky. I was going to say Tom Walsh Green. is probably my smoky, but um, now I have to rethink that because he will not. Um, probably not going to win it. Uh, oh, that's on top of my head. Could Jordan Dawson do it? Mm. Yeah, maybe. that's not a bad. Shot. I think he's probably in the smoky category without being like in the maybe top bracket. Yeah. Um, imagine someone Tom like Tom Green, Noah, I reckon. Yeah, Tom Green, Errol Golden, Errol Golden. Is Tom Green a smoky? He's really pushing it for smoky, I reckon. But but I think in terms of votes, I could be wrong, but I don't think he pulled that much more than Toby Green. Like I think mm. I think he didn't pull that well. He missed some games, but he, considering how like statistically dominant he was, um, I don't think he pulled that close to winning. So, yeah, maybe counts. But I get your point um, for sure. All right, Coleman Medal. I'm going to go real smoky. I, I think 
I actually think Jaya Miss could win it. Yeah. Subscribe. Um, no, let's <laughs> elaborate on that. Let's elaborate on that. Third year player. He's going to be the the focal point for Fremantle. Uh, the same and the same as Oscar Allen for West Coast. I think Oscar Allen's got potential to to kick a lot of goals, and I think Larky did it just through the sheer percentage of like inside fifties that are going to that person. Yeah, I th- again, I think if Fredo get on a little bit of a roll, I think you know there could be big potential there. My guy, you said his name in that list actually is Larky, I think, because I've sort of alluded to. I think North Melbourne's going to improve a bit. Larky nearly won it in a borderline wooden spoon team last year. So if North Melbourne get 10, 20% better, I think Nick Larky's a very good shout to win it, especially because Jez Cameron's probably going to fall off a bit. Charlie Kerno and Harry Mackay are probably going to split goals amongst themselves, so they might eliminate each other to a degree. So I think Nick Larky. Nice. Hard to argue against that, for sure. Very good player. And if North improve... Absolutely. Um, I'm going to say Max King as my Smokey. Yeah. Not, a, not a massive contender. Obviously, you, your mind goes to even Jeremy Cameron could win it, um, but Charlie Kerno and the, both of the boys you mentioned are also contenders. But I, I'm going to go with the guy that missed Harper last year and kicked 28 from 11. And I just think, you know, I think it's his sixth season. I think he'll be turning 24 this year right at the start of his prime, I would argue. So with the Saints yeah. being a good team, Max King is my major contender. Final prediction on a rising star call from both of you, Joycey. Uh, it's Harley Reid. It's got to be Harley Reid. Like, Interesting. Yeah. He he is still the standout. Um, and I think there's been, yeah, a, a bit of negativity uh, because he hasn't had done a sheasel or a Nick Dacos, but he's not that sort of player. He He's a power player, an impact player. Um, I think, yeah, much more a liken to a Horn Francis. Um, but... From what I've seen, yeah, he's really impressed me. He's the standout. I'd probably agree with, I assume you're going to say Reid as well, Jesse, so I'm just going to throw out a different name, even though I think Reid's on the balance of probability he's going to get. But I think George Wardlaw is a very good shout-out as well for Rising Star. He played just enough games last year to have another crack at it again this year. If he has the full year, lives up to his upside, I think he's a good shout. So I've been saying McKercher this whole time and I'm going to change it last minute. And I think Riley Sanders is a mm. Monty to win it at this rate. Like it is just preseason. Yeah. I, I recall back in 2021, I think it was Tanner Bruin exploded in a preseason game. And I was like, yeah, he's going to win it. Got nowhere yeah. near it. So I could be wrong on Sanders, but I do think this guy has like Ashcroft like ability to impact on ball in year one. Like he is so ready made and more ready made than Harley Reid for a midfield spot. I, I think Harley Reid might just be a little bit inconsistent this year because he's playing in such an average team that like he's not going to get the same support as other prospects. But, you know, I, I watched some tape. They, they did a breakdown of the footage of him against Adelaide and some of the stuff he was doing actually went unnoticed. Like some of the clearances he won were very, very exciting. So I think he'll be a genuine contender. But I think Sanders is the man. Just to uh, combat that, although I understand he doesn't have the support by the same token, that means he gets the opportunity. So when he goes on the ball, they, the Eagles are going to be saying, you're the man, you're the one that's going to win it here. Like you are the, the you know, the Dugowie, the the Fife, like you are our man here. When you go down back, you're our distributor. When you go forward, you and Oscar Allen are going to be the targets. I'd also say he does have a bit of support in that midfield. Tim Kelly's still a very good midfielder. And at, depending on Elliot Yo's health and, how he rotates through the middle. He's also a very good bullish player. So I think those two could provide a bit of support for Reid. Hope so. A lot rests on Elliot Yeo's fitness. He hasn't played more than 12 games since 2019, but he's had his first preseason, I think, since then. So, yeah, fingers crossed, but we'll see. All right, boys, this has been great having you back on the True Footy YouTube channel. It's been far too long. Um, I'm sure with this modern technology of StreamYard that I've just found, um, we can do this more regularly. But uh, it's been great, and I'm sure that we will be back together on the channel before too long. And yeah, take care. Thanks, mate. You too, buddy.